Hello. Um, hello. Hello. Welcome to the IHR. My name is Claire Langhammer. Um, since October, I've been the director of the IHR, which I have to say is the most joyful of jobs imaginable. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you here on this somewhat hot and sticky <laughs> evening um, for what is um, a lovely and important um, lecture. And memorial lecture. We are absolutely delighted um, to be hosting this here tonight and delighted that so many of you have been able to come out um, to attend, notwithstanding um, the slightly warm conditions. Um, I wanted to just say that we have we have got some jugs of water um, over there by the um, by the window and some cups. Um, please don't feel um, worried about just getting up and going and helping yourselves. I'll keep an eye on it to make sure it keeps getting replenished um, because the, oh, the alternative is we have people sort of collapsing in the room, which is not going to be in keeping with the, with the spirit of the evening. I, um, so welcome. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, um, Professor Catherine Clark, um, Director of the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community. Um, we'll say a few more words. Pleasure to give the second introduction uh, of the evening. You have to get to one more introduction before you have the, the, the pleasure of Vanessa's lecture. So, as, as Claire said, I'm a professor here at the IHR and director of our Centre for the History of People, Place and Community. And it's lovely to see so many friends of the centre here this evening, um, as well as new faces. And of course, this is one of our first in person events here back in the IHR after COVID. So, thank you so much for braving the temperatures this evening. So as many of you will know, the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community focuses on place-based and site-specific outward-facing research, often grounded in partnerships and collaborations with others. It's home to projects um, as varied as the Victoria County History of England, founded in 1899, today powered by hubs and volunteer groups across the country, and Layers of London, the Heritage Lottery funded digital map-based crowdsourced history project. And I'm really proud that the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community builds on the heritage of the IHR's Centre for Metropolitan History, and it continues that tradition of the highest quality urban history, including especially London history. Most recently, we've built on that legacy with the appointments of my colleague, Justin Coulson, as our new senior lecturer in urban and digital history. Justin, as I know some of you will all know, has specialisms in medieval and early modern London. We're extremely fortunate to have his expertise in the centre, as well as the, the vision and imagination he's already brought to projects for the future. I know the work of Derek Keane has been foundational to Justin's research, and he'll say a bit more about that in a moment, and it's been formative to my own work as a medievalist interested in place and identity. So it's a great honor for us to be launching this annual London lecture in Derek's memory. We have another event coming up in memory of Derek in September, which I think Justin will say a few words about in a moment. So today's lecture comes in the middle of a very busy and exciting week for us in the IHR. We've been enjoying our first ever IHR London Summer School, exploring London past, present, and future. The theme for this inaugural year has been renewal. We've had lectures and workshops on topics ranging from the Great Fire to RAF, Aerial photos of post-war London, uh, Martin Luther King's visit to London in 1964. We've had fantastic trips behind the scenes at St Paul's Cathedral, a tour of the City of London Pedway system, a special visit to the Museum of London. Tomorrow we're off to the Guildhall Library and some medieval livery company archives. So the IHR London Summer School is also very much continuing the legacy of Derek Keane and the Centre for Metropolitan History. We're already really looking forward to next year's summer school and I can reveal, you heard it here first, that next year's theme will be London Secret History, so look out for that. We have another really exciting planning development here in the Centre and the IHR, a new tall postgraduate programme, our MA History, Place and Community, set to launch in autumn 2023. And it's emerged from some completely fresh thinking about what uh, postgraduate taught provision can be. It's going to be flexible and student-centered, offering single module micro-credentials right up to a full MA program. 
And within that, I've included some, some modules with a real emphasis on London that can be accessed as standalone modules for people with an interest in London history as well as part of a, a fuller programme. So we're very excited to be launching that in a year or so's time and to be welcoming, we hope, the next generation of London historians to join us at the IHR. So thanks for being with us this evening and I'll hand over to my colleague, Justin. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Claire, thank you Catherine. So it's a great honour for me as the new lecturer in urban, senior lecturer in urban industry history here at the IHR to be presenting the first of a programme of events that would be um, commemorating the work of Derek Keane in urban and metropolitan history. Um, I've just got a few slides here just to give some context for those of you, I know many of you here will be very familiar with Derek, you have personal memories of Derek. Others might be familiar with just his work and just his name, some of you might be less familiar. Um, together. So I thought I'd just start by giving an indication of the sheer impact that Derek had on the field of, of urban history, of metropolitan history, mm. beginning with the list of, this is just some of the funded research <coughs> projects which he ran here um, at the Centre for Metropolitan History, which Catherine just mentioned. Um, so Derek uh, was born in 1942. He died in 2001, obviously during the COVID lockdown. So we've moved a lot of our um, commemorations to this year. He began as a PhD student, a uh, DPhil student at Oxford with W.A. Panton. And this really sort of sets the, the path, I think, of a lot of his work. His first job after his DPhil uh, was as a researcher with the Winchester Research Unit, working with Martin Biddle, an archaeologist. And that junction between history and archaeology, I think, really shapes a lot of the work that he's done. Mm. Most well known, I think, of all of Derek's work is the social and economic study of medieval London. Uh, colloquially known inside the Institute as the Great Wall of Cheapside, <laughs> <laughs> for the, uh, the sheer volume of index cards working methodically through deeds, wills, property registers, Terriers, you name it, every source for property holding in the city um, covering that period um, was in his remit. But the list of projects here I think gives you a sense of the, the breadth of his interests as well. And I, I will emphasize this is just a selection from a much longer list. Um, London and the Tidal Thames, Maritime Flooding, environmental history I think is such an important part of Derek's work. Um, and people like Jim Galloway, who worked with him on that project, have gone on to, to be pioneers in that field. Housing environments and health, again, these are areas that are increasingly important, perhaps came to be regarded in a new light in the past, past few years for <coughs> quite obvious reasons. So the range of work that Derek did here um, at the CMH was absolutely um, incredible and the number of scholars that he encouraged and supported in the process of doing that is equally impressive. The Social and Economic Study of Medieval London ran from 1979 to 1984, and I think that led quite directly to the founding of the Centre of Metropolitan History in 1988, and Derek was director of that um, centre until 2002. So almost all of these projects happened under his leadership. Derek was incredibly industrious, as um, <laughs> some of you said. One of the things I picked up from conversations with um, Derek's family is that he would enjoy being practical as well as academic. And uh, wood turning and wood carving using a chainsaw were amongst his uh, hobbies as well. So he was very industrious at home as well as at work. I thought I'd include the slide um, of his, his publications. Um, and indeed, the first drift, which we produced for him in 2012, which I was honoured to contribute to, um, has a full bibliography of his publications, which runs to 13 pages in itself. So I started to try and screen grab these to include in the slide, and uh, <laughs> I, got, I got a bit bored. A hugely industrious man in so many ways. <laughs> 
Um, Catherine mentioned that we are going to be holding a, a more um, focused event to reflect on Derek's um, own legacy of research and the impact that he's had in the field. And we can now announce um, the details of that event. You're going to pick up flyers for this upstairs um, in the reception afterwards. So it's a symposium on the 28th of September uh, from 2 p.m., uh, which includes uh, many, <laughs> I've tried to count them here, very many uh, people who have been uh, part of Derek's career speaking in a symposium in a round table format, deliberately with an opportunity for everyone to contribute to discussions about his impact on the field as well as people's memories of him. But when it came to establishing a memorial lecture in his honor, there was only one person that we could really invite to give the inaugural lecture. And that is, of course, Vanessa Harding. Vanessa was one of the researchers on the original social and economic history. I don't think you were there at the very beginning. At the very beginning. The very first. The very first. The first. Um, so Vanessa worked on that project in the very beginning, and Vanessa's career has continued to, to embody, I think, many of the values um, which Derek's work encouraged, at least comparison, uh, work on London and Paris, thinking about material culture and health along with um, social and economic history. <coughs> Vanessa is uh, Emeritus Professor of London History at Birkbeck, University of London, and she is also incoming chair of one of the other organizations that Derek was so keen to sponsor, his, the Historic Towns Trust. And the topic that she's going to be talking on today, the end of medieval London and the Great Fire, I believe, is very much inspired by work that she is doing in the cartographic tradition with the Historic Towns Trust. So, Vanessa. Hi. attention and that you won't nod off uh, as I'm talking. And it's a real pleasure and a sorrow to be giving this lecture today because Derek was my uh, colleague, my mentor, my friend. I was the first research assistant to work on the social and economic study of medieval London, his first London project. Uh, I kept in touch with him all over the rest of my career, his career, uh, and I value enormously um, the experience of working with him. Uh, as you all know, Derek was director of the Centre for Metropolitan History here at the Institute of Historical, Historical Research. <laughs> <laughs> as, as Justin said, he was the author of major contributions to English urban history, such as the great Winchester Studies volumes, uh, and that he did an enormous amount to promote and develop the fruitful collaboration of mm. urban history and archaeology. Uh, he led several innovative research projects and initi initiatives on London and metropolitan history, both before and during his time as director of the CMH. <coughs> and nobody could have been better equipped to be the first professor of comparative metropolitan history. He had an extraordinarily wide span of interests and attention across centuries and across con co uh, continents. He's the only person um, I could imagine being able to make authoritative comparisons between the 12th century and the 17th century, or between the 14th and the 20th, as well as between London, Paris, <coughs> Shanghai, you name it. Bill Kellaway, who was the secretary and librarian of the Institute of Historical Research and a strong supporter of Derek's early projects, once said to me that the thing about Derek uh, was that whereas the rest of us remember one-tenth of what we read and forget the rest, Derek would remember nine-tenths. Mm -hmm. And his particular talent, it always seemed to me, was that he saw beyond what everybody else saw. He could see the flaws in a narrative that was generally taken for granted. He could recognize when small signs pointed to the need for a new interpretation. Mm -hmm. He thought imaginatively about how to address difficult historical problems by asking a different set of questions. Mm 
And I owe a great deal to him personally, as I just said. I was the research assistant on the first London project, predating the Centre for Metropolitan History, the Social and Economic Study of Medieval London for five years from 1979 to 84. It did actually go on for a few more years after that, but those were the glory years. <laughs> now, this project, in a typical Derek way, sought to address an important historical issue by means of an innovative and perhaps unexpected approach. Measuring change and development in the society and economy of medieval London in the absence of statistics or significant data sets is remarkably difficult, and nobody had really got very far with this. But the study aimed to show that it was possible to get round this problem by means of a kind of prosopography of properties using the vast but largely untapped resource of property records in public and private archives. Reconstituting the history of properties creates an organized body of data that allows us to chart changing land values and uses, occupational specializations and shifts, and the character of London's population and economy. And in conceiving the project, Derek drew on his own experience with Winchester and the examples of other historians uh, and projects such as Billy Pantin at Oxford. To, he, that helped him imagine how it might be done, but the program for studying London was his own. Uh, combining depth, the study of the sample area, and breadth in compiling a survey of documentary sources that could be used to extend the methodology to further areas. The backbone of the project was the records of the city's court of Husting, where thousands of property transactions were registered from the mid-13th century, the great bulk of them between around 1300 and the early 16th century. Uh, the two documents on the left are from the Husting rolls but a huge range of other sources existed to be drawn on as well. What was added to this, as I understand, at the uh, planning stage of the project, in which I wasn't involved, was the notion of extending the study beyond the obvious endpoint for medieval London of the dissolution of the monasteries and chantries in the 1530s and 1540s, when landholding in London, as elsewhere, underwent massive change, extending it from then up to the Great Fire of 1666. So the Social and Economic Study of Medieval London became in practice, though not in name, a study of London before the fire. And there proved to be major advantages in this, uh, both practically, records generated by the fire and subsequent rebuilding made a vital contribution to the topographical jigsaw we were constructing. And you can see one of our reconstructed maps up, up, up there. But also the intellectual interest and significance of the results, so we were able to trace the London property market and all the economic and social trends that this stood in for over a cycle of growth, relative decline, and renewed but structurally different growth. <coughs> the developments of the 16th and 17th centuries could be seen in perspective, and this in turn influenced <coughs> understanding of the kind of city that London must have been at the peak of its medieval size in the early 14th century. And this, of course, turned out to be transformational for me as well as for the project, since I was at that stage a medieval historian. I wrote a thesis on London in the 14th century. But as a result of working on this project, I became a crossover medievalist, early modernist, which is something that I've valued ever since, uh, not least since it allowed me to pass myself off as an early modernist when I went for my next job, which was a post in London history advertised after the medieval period. So thinking about working with Derek on the social and economic study of medieval London gave me the topic for this lecture, the Great Fire and the End of Medieval London. It seemed to be an opportunity to reflect on periodization and change in London history, to consider whether the Great Fire could be taken as the end of medieval London in other contexts than the very practical one of property history reconstruction. It certainly served us well there. Are there other areas in which in which it marked an epoch. Perhaps the best way to, to approach this is to think about what characterized medieval London and how or when these features changed. Every historian will come up with different views of this, and I'm sure there are others in this room who would think differently. Um, but here are some. Apart from the fact that it was a notable center of population, attracting migrants from across the nation and beyond, which of course could be true of, of many great cities, Medieval London was a city run by merchants for merchants, a powerful and to quite some degree autonomous player in national politics, 
whose financial strength gave it purchase in dealings with the Crown. A civic community in which guilds played a vital social, economic, and political role. One with a rich religious life centered on a multiplicity of small parishes, and in the later Middle Ages, a place of plague. <coughs> All of these, except for plague, were true of London between the 13th and the early 16th century. Plague obviously came along in the middle of the 14th. Most of them changed, or were changing, in the later 16th and 17th centuries, and none of them was still really the case by 1700. So was the Great Fire just a moment in time on a trajectory already set towards the birth of modern London? I'll start with the most obvious and visible issue, the shape and size of London and the impact of the fire on that. I mean, you could obviously say that medieval London effectively ceased to exist, at least as a physical spatial entity, when a flood of migrants in the 16th and 17th centuries transformed the compact, concentric city, which you see on the left, mostly contained within its ancient walls, into the sprawling, heterogeneous metropolitan conurbation five or six times, sorry, six or eight times as populous and several times as extensive as it was by the late 17th century. This rapid and sustained growth in the 16th century was itself a new phenomenon following a long period of population stasis. Two of Derek's projects, the Social Economic Study, which we've already mentioned, and Feeding the City, which Justin noted, which was a study of London's grain supply around 1300, helped to establish that London reached its medieval peak of extent and population with around 80,000 inhabitants by the early 14th century. By 1377, after the Black Death of 1348-9 to and two further epidemics, London's population was probably no more than 35 to 45,000. And there's little evidence for change over the next century. But by 1500, there were signs of the population recovery, and by 1540, London was growing strongly. And it continued to do so despite numerous recurrences of plague. So London may have been around 50,000 people in 1500, perhaps 80,000 by 1550, 200,000 by 1600, and 400,000 or more by 1660. I mean, you'll recognize these are very round figures, but they give you a sense of the scale, the scope of change. And the physical transformation of London is evidenced in the series of maps of London from about 1560 to 1700 in contemporary literary commentary. That's trying to juxtapose the two maps to give you some sense of how they uh, should relate. Um, and also a wide range of documentary sources. While population density is increased in the city within the walls, it was the spreading suburbs that accommodated most of the increased population and attracted most attention. The London chronicler and choreographer John Stowe, who lived from around 1525 to 1605, observed the change and spread of London and recorded his experience in his 1598 survey of London. In a famous passage, he recalls the farm on the eastern side of the city near the tower, where as a child he bought milk hot from the cow. Subsequently, he says, the farmer, one Goodman, hence Goodman's Fields, let the land out for grazing of horses and then for garden plots and lived like a gentleman thereby. And he cites many other places which in his recollection had been open or, or but sparsely built up and which had since been developed. And obviously this suggests that the development had taken place since the 1540s or 50s at the earliest. So of Hog Lane outside Bishopsgate, for example, he says that within these 40 years, that is, as late as the 1560s, it had been lined with hedges and elm trees, but of late years was made a continual building throughout. Stone's successors and continuators took up the story, documenting further growth, new neighborhoods, and London's changing character. John Speed wrote in 1611 that this London, as it were, disdaining bondage had set herself on each side far without the walls and left her west gate, by which he meant Ludgate, in the midst, from whence with continual buildings she had joined her street, continued her street to the king's palace and joined a second city to herself. No walls are set about this city and those of London are left to show rather what it was than what it is. And Thomas Freeman in 1614 wrote that London was in progress to Islington and that St. Catherine's takes whopping by the hand Hoxton will to Highgate ere it be long. Uh, even if that's a bit of an exaggeration, 
The contemporary perception of London as a billowy, spreading, radically changing physical entity is obvious. And in a different sense, much of what remained of medieval London disappeared in the fire of the 2nd to the 6th of September 1666, which burnt out four-fifths of the walled city and part of the western suburb along Fleet Street. It was estimated that 13,200 houses were burned, rendering perhaps 60,000 people homeless, numerous public buildings from the Royal Exchange to Guildhall, 87 parish churches and St Paul's Cathedral, and of course, millions of pounds worth of domestic and commercial goods. But both the city authorities and the landlords and leaseholders of city properties were eager to rebuild and reoccupy as the rich archive of legislative orders, foundation surveys, arbitrations, funding for improvements testifies. And within 10 years, most of the houses, shops, and places of business have been rebuilt. So the one on the left has the map rather faint, but it is intended to show you how similar the area was before and after the fire, mm. with just two new additions, one new street and one new marketplace. So the rebuilt city, as we know, was both like and unlike its predecessor. It mostly followed the medieval street lines and layout. A couple of new streets were added, off-street marketplaces as well. But many names, institutions, and locations and functions <coughs> continued. The appearance of most buildings changed, but they still drew on the same array of materials as before. Timber, brick, plaster, stone, clay roof tiles. Brick now predominated, and timber was largely removed from site. Roof lines changed, but, they, but tiles weren't replaced by a slate until the 19th century. Stone had always been used for grand and public buildings, but these remained the minority. Things like oversailing frontages and the intermixture of tenancies were banned and architectural features such as windows and door cases changed. <coughs> but actually, rebuilding on old foundations meant that <coughs> medieval and even earlier buildings might survive, underground or embedded in party walls, <coughs> only to be exposed in 19th and 20th century development. New regulations, street widening, the creation of off-street marketplaces reduced the resident population within the walls which might have neared 100,000 before the fire, to perhaps 80,000. Certainly some of the displaced citizens moved west, and Westminster landlords did their best to lock them into long leases to discourage their return to the city after rebuilding. There was actually some anxiety by the mid-1670s that not all rebuilt properties were being immediately occupied. But there was no question that the city itself was abandoned or even severely diminished as a place of work and residence it's hard to identify any increase in suburban building as a result of the fire. And indeed, the city's demand for building materials and craftsmen might even have held back West End development for a while. So the fire didn't either begin or complete the physical transformation of medieval yeah. London. It probably accelerated trends such as the westward shift, but these were already underway. What it did perhaps do was to emphasize the contrast between the dense well-organized and tightly governed medieval city whose bounds had not changed, and the larger metropolis with its mishmash of liberties and jurisdictions. So I'll turn now to some of the other key features of medieval London that I suggested, governance, guilds, religion, play, to explore how long they remained the same and whether the fire marked a significant uh, break. I began by saying that medieval London was a city run by merchants and for merchants. The merchant elite was closely identified with the governance of the city from an early date, though the nature of their business interests changed over time. In the later 13th and early 14th century, vintners and wool merchants predominated among the city's aldermen and mayors. Mercers, grocers, fishmongers, and drapers came to the fore in the later 14th and 15th centuries. The prioritizing of mercantile interests over those of artisans or consumers in civic policy making led to conflicts in the 1370s and 1380s with attempts to limit automatic power, but this had effectively been reasserted by 1400. Though all of London's citizens had to be members of a guild or living <coughs> company, it was only the mercantile guilds that supplied candidates for the court of aldermen and the mayoralty. <coughs> who entered one of the lesser companies had to translate 
to one of the great 12 to advance in city politics. And in fact, the leading six all but monopolized the higher offices in the 16th century, with the mercers and the grocers well in the lead. So merchants still governed London in the 16th and 17th centuries. Greater guild membership didn't restrict a merchant's area of trade, but the majority of 16th century aldermen and mayors were merchant adventurers, exporters of woolen cloth to the Netherlands. As late as 1600 to 25, when about half of the city's court of aldermen were overseas merchants, about three quarters of these had merchant adventurer or cloth export interests. As trading ventures diversified, so did the interests of the aldermen. By 1640, nearly half the court of aldermen were Levant traders or East India Company directors, or both. Though the Civil War years saw major changes to the court of aldermen, with a much wider range of economic and commercial interests represented, at the Restoration, the mercantile predominance revived. Sir Thomas Bloodworth, Lord Mayor at the time of the fire, was a member of the Vintners Company, but served also on the governing committees of the East India, the Levant, and the Royal African Companies, and he made a fair fortune trading in lead and silks. But by this time, the centuries-long association of the merchant elite and civic office was weakening. From the 13th to the early 17th centuries, the richest men in the city had taken office as a matter of course, and in a spirit of noblesse oblige, as well as for its advantages. Increasingly, in the 17th century, they refused office and concentrated on business, leaving office holding to others. All the men wielded great <coughs> power and patronage, but they were also liable to prop up the city's finances, and civic office placed huge demands on their time. It was possible for a man nominated to an aldermanry against his inclination to fine out of office, that is, to pay a fine to be excused from serving. Very few did so in the 16th century or earlier, but as this graph from Richard Bunderley's article shows, uh, the numbers increased in the early 17th century, uh, and there was a huge increase in the 1640s and 1650s. 130 men fined out in 1649 to 51 alone, owing 70,000 pounds in fines to the city, though by no means all of this was collected. Now, obviously, in these very turbulent times, there could be many reasons for not wishing to take office, but the city was clearly also aiming to raise revenue through fining, even though this made it harder to fill vacancies with appropriately qualified candidates. The practice continued after the Restoration, up until 1673, when the city's difficulties in finding suitable men led to a ban on fining out of office. The exclusion of nonconformists from office under the Restoration Settlement must have contributed to these problems. And from 1673 onwards, those nominated were obliged to serve. However, the, the character of the court of aldermen was changing too. From the later 16th century, men of the minor companies, few of whom were overseas merchants, so some were certainly inland traders, were able to become aldermen, though they were still required to upgrade to one of the great 12 companies before serving as Lord Mayor. This didn't actually change until the middle of the 18th century. So the number and range of aldermen from minor companies increased considerably in the later 17th century. In 1700, though the court was still dominated by the great 12 livery companies, now goldsmiths and merchant tailors had taken the lead, with several lesser companies represented. Only half a dozen or so were Levant or East India Company traders, though several were directors of the new Bank of England. And by the 18th century, the view that the city was run by small businessmen rather than by merchant princes was well established. Again, it's hard to ascribe to the far a really significant role in this area, uh, the growing di divergence between the mercantile elite and the city's rulers. But it does seem likely that the physical dis dislocation of the city centre, the challenges this posed to many mercantile businesses occupied their attention. Many, including Bloodwork, claimed serious losses in the fire. But I think also important was the growth of the financial interest, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly the goldsmith bankers, whose court connections were as important as their city ones. So wealthy goldsmith bankers of the later 17th century, such as Jeremiah Snow and Robert Blanchard, set up businesses in the Strand instead of, or as well as, in the city. And they didn't follow their predecessors, like the Viners or Sir Edward Backwell, 
intercity office. If medieval London was governed by merchants for merchants, one seemingly unifying feature of the city's political as well as its social and economic life was guild membership. Citizenship and membership of a guild or livery company, as they came to be known, went hand in hand. From the early 14th century, all would-be free men had to be vouched for by members of the occupation they intended to practice, which effectively meant the masters or wardens of a guild or company. Every merchant alderman had undergone the same process of apprenticeship, induction into the ethos of citizenship and company membership, and enfranchisement as a citizen, as the modest artisan turner or shoemaker. The companies had a variety of origins in fraternal, religious, and occupational associations, but structures and purposes converged over the 14th and 15th centuries. All the artisan companies by 1500 identified themselves with a branch of economic activity over which they claimed jurisdiction, regulating practitioners in their own interests and those of the wider civic community, or so they claimed. Most of them struggled with the tension between enforcing membership and limiting numbers of practitioners, between keeping out foreigners or unfree workers and maintaining a sufficient pool of skilled labor. This tension was resolved in the direction of expansion rather than restriction in the 1530s, with Acts of Parliament limiting the fees for apprenticeship and membership, which had in some cases been prohibitively high, and guild membership increased by approximately two-thirds in the next two decades. That is far faster than population was growing. So 69 London guilds or companies were named in lists of 1501, and at least another nine existed at that date. A similar number existed in 1537-8, though the lineup changed over time as individual associations formed, merged, split, or ceased to function. Membership figures aren't usually given in these lists, um, or necessarily accurate when they are, but in the early 16th century, the companies ranged from the large mercantile ones, such as the mercers, drapers, and merchant tailors, with over 200 or 250 members, through middling-sized ones, such as the brewers, the barber surgeons, the butchers, the leather sellers, with over 100, down to small ones with a few, with a few dozen members. And this last group included such <coughs> specialized crafts as bead makers, curers, that was makers of woolen caps, and cobblers, and victualling occupations such as tasculars, fruiterers, and cheesemongers. The guilds continue to be important in the political, social, and economic life of the city in the 16th and 17th centuries. Membership numbers increased, especially in the textile companies. The drapers had over 2,000 members by 1617, and the merchant tailors' membership has been estimated at 8,000 at the same period. In addition to access to citizenship and to the hierarchy of civic office, they offered fraternity and conviviality, networking and patronage, charitable support and protection, and a strong sense of identity. Their control over the practice of particular trades through their powers of search and discipline was not negligible, and the model of traditional company organization remained attractive to the city and the crown, as well as to craft practitioners. The brick and tile makers, for instance, petitioned in 1634 to be incorporated as a company to govern their craft within 20 miles of London, citing the badness of the stuffs now usually made and the advantage of re re reducing building in timber. This is 30 years before the farm. New companies continued to be formed for new manufacturers and specialisms such as clock making, needle making, felt making, or tin plate making. At least 80 city companies were in existence at the beginning of the 18th century, with thousands of members between them. However, by this time, the company's collective grip on the economic life of the metropolis as a whole had been much weakened. In crude terms, the companies lost their claim to monopoly control of skilled employment opportunities as their numbers and membership, even though these grew, failed to keep pace with the rapid demographic growth and spread of the capital. This was apparent to interested parties by 1600 and only increased over the 17th century. So if up to two thirds of adult male Londoners were citizens and company members in the mid 16th century, probably fewer than one in five were by the 1690s. So tens of thousands of men and women practiced crafts, 
open shops and traded retail and wholesale in the late 17th century metropolis without reference to the companies. The classic explanations of the decline of guilds and companies in the early modern period tended to focus on institutional rigidity, self-defeating hostility to changing economic realities in the outside world. I think more sympathetic interpretations would acknowledge that few institutions were able to adapt to the pace and scale of London's demographic and geographical growth, and that companies themselves operated in an increasingly difficult, difficult environment. A profusion of new manufacturers, and particularly new modes of production, more service and more casual employment, changed the nature of work and challenged the assumed primacy of the domestic workshop. Alternative forms of association came into being. The balance of costs and benefits became less favorable to company membership, and its attractions must surely have been further diminished as the companies proved powerless to protect members against a trade slum or against capitalistic exploitation. The spread of the metropolis also meant that by 1660, the majority of Londoners lived outside the area of jurisdiction of mayor and aldermen. So the appeal of guild membership as the entree to citizenship itself waned. Uh, the red line drawn very roughly is the extent of the mayor and alderman's jurisdiction north of the river, so that so much of the, of the rest of the new building is outside that area. So although this process had been underway for some time, the fire did play a part in the further loosening of guild control, albeit in the interest of rebuilding and repopulating the city. The need to attract building workers to the city was recognized in the first Rebuilding Act of 1667, which covered a huge range of issues, from street widths to house types to the price of building materials. But it also enacted that all carpenters, bricklayers, masons, plasterers, joiners, and other artificers, workmen, and laborers to be employed in the said buildings who are not free men of the said city should be free to practice their trades for seven years or as long as the rebuilding took and afterwards be at liberty to work in the trades for life. So those companies' monopoly of those particular occupations was effectively broken. Subsequently, civic efforts to police the freedom by prosecuting those practicing trades in the city or within the guild's jurisdiction without being freemen were also suspended. In 1673, as the rebuilding and repopulation of the city seemed to be in danger of faltering, the Common Council ruled that anyone offering to take up permanent residence in the new-built houses and shops was to be admitted gratis to the freedom of the city. So this act effectively bypassed the company's direct control of admission to the freedom, and while it certainly prompted an increase in new citizens, it further undermined the company's standing and prerogative. We obviously shouldn't write off the late Stuart and 18th century guilds, many of which still flourish to this day, but their role in civic life, civic life was certainly different. A further area where the fire did, I think, mark a real change for a long-running aspect of London is the place and status of the church. Of course, the Reformation of the 16th century was the greatest upheaval in this area, with the dissolution of London's numerous monastic houses in the 1530s, the suppression of all chantry foundations in the 1540s. Belief, liturgy, and practice all changed. Londoners no longer said prayers for the dead, founded obits and chantries, joined religious fraternities, or went on pilgrimage. Their revered saint, patron <coughs> saint, Charles Beckett, was dethroned and removed from the city's seal. But though there was a break with Rome, the break with the past was not as radical as some would have wished. The Reformation essentially left untouched the structure and constitution of the church in London, including the ecclesiastical hierarchy, the bishop and the church court, and crucially, its parish-focused organization, parish organization. The traditional idea of the parish was as a spiritual community that was spatially coextensive with the resi residential one, with obligations on all inhabitants to support worship there, and corresponding rights to receive the succor of the church. And broadly speaking, this remained the case for another century after the Reformation. The parish church remained the focus of regular worship, which all were expected to attend. Elizabethan and Stuart parishioners paid tithes to their rector or vicar and rates to their vestry, took office as church wardens, 
joined in campaigns to rebuild or refurbish their churches, and normally chose to be buried in church or churchyard, just as their medieval predecessors had done. Medieval London had something over 100 parish churches, and unlike cities such as York or Winchester, lost few of them to late medieval population decline. There were some adjustments in the 16th and 17th centuries, but most early modern Londoners worshipped in the same structures as their predecessors, albeit with different furnishings and decoration. Although the Anglican Church paid somewhat less attention to the beauty of holiness, at least before Archbishop Lord, churches continued to be repaired and occasionally rebuilt. Elaborate funeral monuments proclaimed loyalty to church and local community. Bells were often a focus of local fundraising and benefaction, despite the formed concern at the superstitious potential of bell ringing. London city livings were, were generally quite valuable, and both before and after the Reformation could attract better educated men than the average. <coughs> people got a better uh, style of uh, <coughs> churchmanship, I don't know. A good many advisors, formerly held by religious houses, came into the crowns or the bishops' hands at the Reformation. Others were held by Oxford or Cambridge colleges or city livery companies. This could mean that parish clergy reflected the views and interests of their patrons rather than their parishioners, whether leading towards stricter Calvinism or newer Arminianism. But Londoners didn't hesitate to supplement or counter the style of worship imposed on them with something more to their taste. It was an interesting parallel with medieval parish activism, which saw the formation of a number of parish fraternities by groups of parishioners supporting a particular cult or devotion in their church. And in a similar way, Londoners after the Reformation raised money or left endowments for additional sermons, lectures and lectureships, and even thousands, in order to ensure the style of churchmanship that they preferred. So the comprehensive and sufficient nature of parochial worship was a central principle of the Elizabethan settlement, but differing views on reformed liturgy, practice, and organization emerged. Most of these focused on changing the church from within as above. Only a handful of separatist and independent churches could be identified before the 1630s, but they represent a fundamentally different conception of the basis for church organization the voluntary gathered congregation of saints rather than the territorially organized parish. The turmoil of the 1640s allowed many more divergent views on church organization to be voiced. A leading independent of the time described parish boundaries as that invisible line drawn by the hand of blindness in times of ignorance and superstition. However, the reformed church established by parliament remained centered on the parish though its governing structures were Presbyterian and classical rather than Episcopal. London's parish churches and parish communities survived, and the Restoration Settlement re-established the Episcopal, parochial, territorial Church of England. But it was, in fact, the fire of 1666 that disrupted the centuries-old pattern of parishes in London. 87 parish churches were burnt, but only 39 of these were to be rebuilt. The parishes whose churches were not rebuilt were united for ecclesiastical purposes with a neighboring parish and thereafter shared clergy, sacraments and services and obligations, worshiping for the most part in new buildings in a radically different architectural style. The pre-fire parishes survived as units of poor relief administration, so their inhabitants retained some sense of identity with lost ecclesiastical parishes. But the unity and intimacy of the small city center parishes had gone. Another important point here is that the suburban parishes outside the area of the farm were always very much larger in acreage than the city center ones. And as the major locus of new population settlement, they became very populous. Several were each as large as a significant provincial town. The parishes that ringed the walls by 1700 uh, each contained populations of something somewhere between 2,500 and 10,000 people. Parishes that had been largely open and cultivated land in 1550, such as St. Martin in the Fields, now had populations in the tens of thousands. The population of the huge parish of Stepney, which comprised most of East London, had grown from less than 2,000 inhabitants to over 40,000 
by 1700. So for most late 17th century Londoners, therefore, the parish was no longer self-evidently a neighborhood, an intimate community, easily apprehended as a spatial environment, and offering personal and direct human contact with fellow parishioners through collective worship. And the Church of England was a loser by the far in other ways. The high Anglicanism of the Restoration Establishment alienated many moderate Presbyterians who'd hoped for a more inclusive church. The Corporation Act excluded nonconformists from civic office, and the Five Mile Act of 1665 banished nonconformist preachers from the city. But in the turmoil of plague and fire, when many Anglican clergy apparently fled the city, nonconformist preachers came into their own. In historian Gary McRae's <coughs> view, quote, the experiences of plague and fire were signature events for a generation of Londoners. So when the nonconformist clergy met their spiritual distress, their allegiance was fixed. The gathered the nonconformist churches had another two decades of fugitive and persecuted existence until toleration <coughs> restored the civil rights of dissenters. But the new churches they were then able to establish were direct competitors to the Anglican church, and as before, their congregations ignored the parish boundaries. So the loss of so many churches in the fire and the complete dislocation of resident <coughs> congregations was therefore a double blow to a church that was essentially territorial and parochial, in which actual churches were a cornerstone of worship and the physical focus of parish life. Compared with independent preachers in their gathered congregations, Anglicanism was at a loss to maintain its ministry. And it was also a financial sufferer, not just for the cost of rebuilding its churches and the cathedral, but in the loss of the property and the, the, sorry, the tithe and property revenue on which it depended. And although it spared some further expense, the decision that less than half the burned churches would be rebuilt must have been felt as a real loss of status. Finally, or penultimately, um, an end note on plague, a fact of London life from 1348. For three centuries, London was subject to periodic epidemics against which the authorities and authorities were virtually powerless. In the 15th century, plague may have been one of the factors restraining London's population growth, though by the 16th, migration was sufficiently strong to replace the plague dead very rapidly, despite a series of at least half a dozen very severe plagues. But the social cost of plague, bereaved and broken families, disrupted trade, lost livelihoods, increased poverty, was obviously enormous. The rapid succession of the plague epidemic of 1665 <coughs> and the fire of 1666 seemed no coincidence to contemporaries, as this suggests. Uh, they fitted them into narratives of sin <coughs> and retribution, along with, according to choice, civil war, <coughs> regicide, sectarianism, monarchy, and popery. So the significance of both plague and fire was increased when seen as part of a providential pattern. Seeing them as connected in an epidemiological sense, however, took longer. And this happened in the 18th century, when England had been free of plague for some 50 years, so that 1665 could be seen as the end of an era for which some explanation might be sought. The outbreak of plague in Marseille in 1720 sparked <coughs> a new interest and a flood of public publications of which Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year is the best known. As Laurie Jones has recently shown, England's freedom from plague at that time was co-opted into the discourse of English exceptionalism in its embattled anti-continental position. Plague was other, foreign, and importantly, past. The destruction of the city by fire in 1666 seemed to explain the disappearance of domestic plague, both by destroying its seeds and purifying the air, and as a result of enlarging and keeping clean the streets. Now, this was obviously nearly two centuries before the identification of Yersinia pestis and the promotion of the rat flea vector, but the two <coughs> approaches were easily assimilated, and the popular view that the fire cleansed the city of plague remained. It's probably not bright enough for you to see very clearly the picture at the far end, that there is a hand of doom coming down over Londoners with uh, uh, fires in the streets and rats running away from it. But, in fact, as documentary evidence <coughs> shows, uh, the worst hit, uh, plague did not cleanse the city of, sorry, fire did not cleanse the city of plague. 
the documentary evidence, uh, this is from Justin Champion's project, which was one of the ones based at the Centre of Metropolitan History, looking at the plague of 1665. Uh, the worst hit areas in the epidemic of 1665 were the suburbs, uh, while the city centre, the area burned in 1666, which I've again outlined rather crudely in red, was much less badly affected. So if anything, the displacement of people caused by the fire would have increased crowding and poor conditions in the suburbs, at least for the next few years. The density of population within the walls certainly declined as a result of the street widening and improvements entailed in the rebuilding. But the area that was rebuilt was arguably the one that least needed it. The environmental regulations imposed on rebuilders were almost entirely concerned with minimizing the risk of fire and not disease. The disappearance of plague from London was part of a much wider pattern that of its disappearance from Western Europe. A topic that I would have liked to include in this overview, but obviously lacked time and space for, is the impact of the fire on the relations of city and crown and its place in the longer story of crown-city interactions. I think this could have been a lecture in itself. So what I think I can say here is that the corporation of the city was weakened by the fire in reputation, finances, and status. Lord Mayor Bloodworth's ineffective response to fighting the fire was widely criticized. I mean, it's mentioned by Pepys, but a good number of other contemporaries mentioned it as well. He and the aldermen failed to intervene decisively, leaving the heroic role to the king and the Duke of York, a view summed up in this design for one of the plaques on the monument. I don't know how well you can see, but uh, Charles, II, Charles II is somewhat smirkingly uh, looking towards um, the city of London, uh, which is fainting and languishing uh, and bringing all sorts of goods to support it. The fire destroyed many public buildings owned by the corporation, uh, sorry, Guildhall, the city's cloth and commodity markets, the prisons, the gates, and the Royal Exchange, and all of these had to be rebuilt. The aftermath also involved the corporation in major expenditure in surveying, dis dispute resolution, and street and public works improvements. And although some of the cost of this was paid out of an exceptional levy uh, on coal imports, this contributed to the third element in the situation, the reduction of the corporation to supplicant status vis-a-vis -vis the Crown and Parliament. A really important part of the city-crown relationship since the Middle Ages had always been the ability of the city to supply money in loans, gifts, and tax revenues, at least if nicely approached. But now, the city desperately solicited support from the Crown and Parliament to get its rebuilding bills enacted. Uh, it had to bid for a reduction <coughs> in its tax burden and for further assistance from the coal duties. In the long run, losses from the fire undoubtedly contributed to the near collapse of the corporation's <coughs> finances in the 1680s, just as the parties were squaring up for constitutional confrontation. So in conclusion, as I hope is clear, I'm not arguing that the Great Fire was itself a decisive turning point, but that in some areas at least, it played a significant part in long-term change. Individual factors arising directly from the fire inflected ongoing trends so that one can say, yes, this does mark a change. But as for the end of medieval London, as long as there are scholars, students, citizens with access to London's amazing archive, this won't happen soon. And I'd like to conclude by returning to the social and economic study of medieval London noting my gratitude to Marianne Kowalewski, who I don't actually think is here, and her assistants, who are digitizing part of the archive of the project, hundreds of eight by five cards, as Justin said, stored in the Great Wall of Cheapside, which is a bank of filing cabinets about eight feet high, something like that. It's a bit terrifying when you think about the weight of it all. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, we took notes uh, by hand in pencil on index cards. This is part of Mary Ann's great Medieval London's database project. And it's been fascinating, and for me somewhat poignant, to revisit the archive with them after nearly 40 years, and to see Derek's characteristic spiky handwriting again. He was left-handed, he had very distinctive handwriting. It's a great imaginative leap from notes taken, as I've said, by hand in pencil, onto cards in an archive, to a digitized online enterprise 
accessible worldwide and encouraging mass participation. It's wonderful that this resource will be made available to a much wider range of potential users and that Derek's scholarship, achievements and insights will continue to influence and be appreciated by further generations. Thank you.